it's eight o'clock. I'm I'm very curious to hear why do you choose to choose this topic, and I'm very curious for you to start sharing. Oh yes, uh, we have an introduction first. So uh, before I go, let's introduce ourselves. Here I have my slide, and then ho hope everyone is doing well um, now. Still remember we started the webinar series during the circuit breaker in Singapore, and uh, now we are in halfway through phase two, two A or I, I don't know, waiting for phase three. But anyway, so natural glass exists. Wow. And uh, who are we? We are the Far East Gems Group. We have the Gem Lab, where we do uh, diamond grading, gem identification, and valuation. We are, um, it's run by my father, Mr. Tay Tai San, and uh, we are an ISO 17,025 laboratory audited by the government every year. And all our equipments are calibrated so that uh, we can give you clear results and accurate results. Uh, on top of that, we run the Institute. Okay, today we are broadcasting live from Far East Gem Institute here at Arumugam Road. So uh, we hold courses like uh, gemstone courses, gemstone, diamond, and jade courses. In 2021, we'll be rolling out a few new courses such as rubies, uh, courses on uh, identification of heat treatment and also pearls. So stay tuned, stay tuned. And uh, we also run diploma courses from uh, London for, I mean, we don't run the diploma course, but you can take the practical courses here. And uh, we are Allied Teaching Center with Gem A. And we do have a certified diamond grader course that we run together with Bell, uh, HRD. Next up. Far East Gems and Jewelry. This is a company where we, we supply gemstones. Uh, you can see all these beautiful gemstones and also colored diamonds, a wide range of uh, gemstones you can find on www.fareastgemsjewelry.com. Yeah, so those of you who want to collect some nice, beautiful gemstones, you can go there. And uh, we have a bespoke company called the King's Bespoke, where we customize uh, special specialized jewelry uh, for any a special a any occasion like anniversaries, uh, engagements, birthdays, you name it. So the King's Bespoke. And uh, we have a Far East Gems Import. It's a company that uh, does uh, gem sourcing and manufacturing and we supply to some designers and uh, companies, jewelry companies. Last but not least, the Gem Museum. This is why you are here and this is brought to you by the Gem Museum where we would like to be a platform, international platform to connect the gems and jewelry industry with the rest of the world. So, the Gem Museum. Okay, let's welcome Andrew. Andrew Neil, take it away, man. Thank you, Kuming. Hi, everyone. It's so glad to be back. Um, we, yeah, actually, we have, we should, um, I mean, this topic, we should, I initially planned to talk it in November. But yeah, we, we, in the year end, we have so many events. But anyway, um, I know Kuming wants to know why I choose this topic. So, um, you know, ever since I started working in the museum, okay, I've done so many research on how rocks are formed and how, how we humans um, utilize the things that nature give, gave us, you see. It's like every, everywhere you go, you see the tiles, you see the rocks on the floor is actually what we found in nature, but we use it to our own purposes. So glass is no difference. You see, glass is, um, yeah, glass was first founded in nature and it was used by human as well. We just, now it's just one of the, one of the things that we 
made um, for many purposes. Like um, you, you basically you see everywhere, right? So um, it's just one of the, it's just, I chose this topic is just, is glass is not something to be uh, taken lightly off and something that we should really appreciate that okay it originates from nature so we really have to um give it credit you see so yeah andrew i you know today we have a few visitors in the museum that actually asked about Swarovski. yes exactly and uh and Swarovski was uh it's actually a glass company Mm. Yeah, and, and they created the glass that, you know, mesmerizes people all over the world. Yeah, so uh, previously there's a, there's, a, um, there's a visitor who works in a glass company that's supplied to Swarovski as well. So she, she kind of confirms um, the, the whole Swarovski material. Uh. So... It says yeah. some secret ingredient that makes yeah, it. Yeah, with okay. some secret ingredient. That's why their crystals are sparkly, you know, more sparkly than the usual glass. So anyways, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. So yes, natural glass exists. Um, when, when I was trying to promote this webinar to, to my visitors, um, that came dropped by the museum. They were they were actually quite surprised that, uh, yeah, they never thought natural glass exists before. I mean, like we do have a few specimens that that's available for viewing in in our museums. And once I told them that it's natural glass, I mean, like they they're kind of like mind blown. You see, they never thought of uh, a glass can be natural because it's it's something we see every day. You see, it's something that we might have taken granted of. But um, yeah, anyways, uh, natural glass exists. So introduct, um, so wait, wait, it's not responding. Okay. So as usual is the, the webinar Zooming to Gems is brought to you by Kuming and Huying, the co-founders of the Gem Museum and myself, the curator of the Gem Museum. And to start things off, um, before we go to natural glass, right? We have to know what glass really is, okay? Glass is one of the most utilized and versatile material made by humans, okay? It's, it's, it's something that we all know, or maybe we've seen a lot, but how well do we know it? That's, that's the main question, okay? So glass is, it's very useful because it has bountiful functionality because it has uh, very, I mean, very unique properties. Okay, it's transparent, it's inexpensive, it's easy to manufacture, okay? And most importantly, it's quite resistant to heat and chemically inert, okay? That means even if you put the strongest acid in a glass jar, it will not have any effects. Acid that could dissolve anything, you could not dissolve glass. So glass, you can see anywhere from furniture, from your window panels, from uh, your kitchen, kitchenware. And it's just um, something is so common that you may not even bother to know what it really is. So that's what we're trying to say. So even, even in my room right here, I can see a few things that is made out of glass. It's just, uh, it's a material that kind of lifts up the, the, the class of the, you know, the class of the atmosphere. It makes it everything looks more, much better, right? And what is actually glass is? Okay, glass is a kind of a, comp a complicated material because it is a liquid form of mainly silicon dioxide or SiO2, right? But the liquid form is in solid state. Okay, this sounds very confusing. Okay, imagine I have, a, I have a bottle of water. The water is in the liquid form, okay? It will go into any shape that I put it in. For example, if I put it in the mug, it will become the shape of a mug. 
but the glass is in a solid state, as we all know. So that state is what we call an amorphous, right? Amorphous is a solid without a crystalline structure. So all minerals on Earth, they, they have a crystalline structure except for uh, perhaps a handful of uh, gems and, and minerals. Um, for example, glass is one of them, okay? Um, what else? Amber, opal, um, and, and many organic gemstones like corals and pearls, they all are amorphous. They, are, do, they do not have any crystalline, crystalline structure. So if you look at the picture right here, a crystalline structure means how the orderly arrangements of atoms. If this, are, this two um, diagram uh, is a comparison between the quartz, which is also a silicon dioxide and the glass. So you can see how their atomic arrangements looks like, right? For the quartz, it has a specific pattern, right? Specific pattern, it arranges uh, very orderly in layers, in stacks, and all of them, they have their specific position. Whereas glass or amorphous, um, amorphous materials, they are randomly allocated atoms, right? So crystalline structure, they tend to have this um, habits, what we call habits, that means the crystal shape itself. Quartz is a, a pointed uh, prism, pointed uh, pyramid, and glass, it can make into anything. So and glass is, um, yeah, it can be made by just heating ordinary sands, but it's not a normal heating that you can you can turn on in a stove. It has to be heated up to seventeen thousand degrees Celsius um, because sands um, they are mostly composed of silicon dioxide, which is uh, yeah SiO two, the same uh, mineral as quartz. So the the history, uh, unfortunately, there isn't much. Um, record about who first discovered glass, who first attempted to make glass, or yeah, or even um, who who discovered, who attempt. Yeah, basically, it doesn't have um, a clear record on these two things. But according to several sources, there are the general idea about the glass making can be traced back to 4,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia is um, one of the first civilizations that uh, that is in, I would say, around the Middle East. Around the Middle East, it, it's, it's actually a quite a big empire that stretches from uh, Southern Europe to, to Egypt. And on back to, back to the days, um, in Mesopotamia, they they are considered the most civilized uh, culture. So people also do find um, glass made from them. Um, that's why people think that they they are the first civilizations to invent the glass making, right? And and the idea may actually contributed from metal smithing. So black metal smithing in, in terms of like the blacksmith where they used to make um, weapons, the metals, maybe armories that involves high temperature furnaces, okay? So again, nobody knows where, who first um, experimented on um, glass making, but what I assume is people love to experiment things people have their curiosity. That's, that's what makes us human. You see, we are curious, we want to try new things. And what I assume is the people working in the furnaces, they will just um, kind of get bored of metal smithing. They'll just put a, cu a cup of sand and they just put it into the furnace to see what's ha what will, will it turn out to be. So um, maybe accidentally it became uh, a melted sand. So. So what we call the glass, you see? 
And maybe that's what happened. And you can see in the picture right here is just how the ancient time looks like, how the um, glass making furnaces, uh, it looks. And the picture on the right, it shows an ancient Egypt glass vase um, painted with patterns. And even by the time the people have already started to kind of um, perfect the arts of glass making, right? And yeah, what am I just saying? Um, yes, oops. Okay, so um, glass making in ancient time is, um, they were very slow and costly due to their lack of technology. Unlike the time now, um, where we can make it really fast and in, uh, efficiently, um, glass back then, it was considered a luxury household component, right? And around throughout the, and as, as time passes through, more inventions happen, okay? It's, it's, it's just how people want to perfect the technique of glass making. So they developed this glass blowing technique. And since then, once it's developed, the glass industry actually flourished it became, it's no longer became a luxury household component. It, it allows even the most ordinary citizen to have glass. So the art of glass making remains the same since the first century AD, except for, of course, there were um, people who were just starting to add different recipes, different elements into the glass to make it more, more solid, make it more durable. So, the first century AD, there's a record that the Romans were actually the first um, culture to make glass windows, glass panels, right? And, um, and right now you can see many usage of glass, um, not just uh, as a furniture or buildings. People make useless glass to make arts, sculptures, like these big two pictures right here. These two are a magnificent. You, yeah, in first glance, you don't really see, you don't really think that these two are really glass until uh, you really do some research, research on this. So these are some of the modern techniques where they can make anything um, based on their imaginations. And glass recipes, um, you know, like the pyrite glass, um, they, they will add, sometimes they will add uh, lead to make it more durable. Like the pyrex glass is uh, basically they added boron in it. So it makes it, um, you know, a, a, a higher end, you know, glass material. And here is some of the glass making processes. Okay. Um, it's actually quite simple. You, you basically just heat the molten glass into a, a blob and the craftsman will just stick it stick a steel hollow steel pipe through it. So he would just blow air to inflate it. And the inflated molten glass would just be molded into molded or cut into into any shape, any shape they want. Okay. Maybe based on demands or maybe based on um, their existing designs. And then in the end a base will be made and in the end the the glass will be just left left to cool. So glass is uh yeah, it's it's simple to make right now. And and that's all uh from the man-made glass. It's uh quite a, a quite a straightforward uh subject. I mean but what about the glass from nature? Okay. Um Glass from nature, they have many different kinds of uh, natural glass, believe it or not. So the most common kind of natural glass is the obsidian, right? Obsidian is a black volcanic glass. It's actually cool lava, okay, as a matter of fact. And obsidian is one of the first glass known, also being the first glass to be utilized 
by humans. Okay, it was fashioned into um, weapons such as axes, spear points, and even arrowheads by the people in the Stone Age because they can be polished into a very sharp weapons. Yes, so glass, as we all know, it can be sharp when it shatters. So what happens uh, in the lava is it, it has to be cooled very rapidly in order to become this glassy state of obsidian. And another recipe for the obsidian to be uh, the formation of the obsidian is when the, the magma comes out as um, Coming, comes out to become an extrusive igneous rock in the form of lava, it has to lose moisture, okay? It has to lose moisture and become thick, just like how you simmer a soup. The longer you simmer, it becomes thicker. All the essence will be left behind. So it's just, it's, it's just the same as uh, like that, you see? The magma has to be thick. It has to be concentrated for it to be, um, for it to be obsidian. Um, prior to that, it has to be cooled rapidly. Either um, it could be, it, the lava could just flow into the sea um, based on different circumstances, I'm not sure. So that's how obsidians really look like. And apart from this black glossy volcanic glass, there are a few varieties of obsidian as well. Okay, here are some the three varieties of obsidians. Okay, first of all is the snowflake. Okay, snowflake, the picture on the left, you can see like uh, white spots on the black volcanic glass. And those white spots are caused by unbalanced crystallizations um, that created these clusters or individuals white or gray crystallolites throughout the obsidian, okay? Crystallolite is also uh, a form of silicon dioxide. It's just uh, under different uh, conditions, they would crystallize in a different way. It's not like, um, the, it's maybe it's, it differs with how the obsidian is formed. So that's how it created this special um, snowflakes. This, this picture right here is, you can see it's just some round spherical patches, but those well-formed snowflakes, as the name suggests, it forms in a very nice snowflake patterns, you see? So this is uh, this picture right here doesn't really tell the true snowflake patterns of the obsidian. So next is the rainbow obsidian. This one uh, uh, you can see in a picture in the middle, okay, is, quite uncommon to find. It has this multicolored iridescence within the stone, okay? And those iridescence are actually caused by nanoparticle inclusions. It could be either other minerals or it could be dust. Uh, it could be anything, okay? I haven't seen one before until just now I, I, when I arrived at the Institute. Coming showed me a piece of uh, rainbow obsidian, which is um, uh, really, really beautiful, <laughs> okay? And last but not least is the sheen obsidian. So sheen obsidian, it has this uh, adventurescence, right? If you know, um, sunstone is one of the uh, gemstones that has adventurescence, but obsidian also has adventurescence varieties of its own which is the sheen. So as we all know, the, sheet, the obsidian will cool very rapidly, okay? And once it cools rapidly, it tends to trap gas and ashes um, throughout layers within the, the obsidian that will create this, either it will be silver or a gold adventurescence. So in this, um, the photo right here, you can see, it's a little bit golden color. So it, and the key of course is to look at the real stuff. So you have to rock and tilt the stone in order to see the, the flashes, the sheen on the obsidian. So 
apart from just a normal black volcanic rock, these are the three uh, varieties, I would say uh, very special varieties of the obsidian, right? Next would be the moldavite. Moldavite uh, is among the most popular, most desirable, collectible natural glass out there. And in fact, it is a variety of tectite, which I'm gonna talk about later, okay? Moldavite is the only tectite that is in a gemstone quality. That means it can be cut into a gem, okay? Because of its transparency and its color, it can be, um, it's usually green, okay? It has a green base color with yellow or brown modifiers, okay? It can be a yellowish green, it can be brownish green, or easier to refer, ref, uh, to refer is like a muddy green, a very dirty kind of green, okay? And moldavite is actually created by the intense heat of a meteor impact, okay? The intense heat would liquefy the surrounding sand, okay? And what, as a result, the sand would actually flow up into the sky. It would scatter high and wide through, um, throughout the surroundings, or, or even depending on the direction where the meteor hits the earth, it will go to the other directions. And the chemical composition of moldavite can be variable, but mainly it's SiO2, silicon dioxide, plus um, two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxide, so aluminum oxide. So, and what we all know Moldavite is it's um, wrinkly surface, right? So for those collectors, they would prefer to collect Moldavite in its original state instead of a faceted one, because the rugged surface of uh, a rough Moldavite is, um, it's kind of alienish, you know, something from outer space. It, you, and you don't really see any, any gems or any rough minerals that have this kind of rugged surface, you see. So, and it's actually quite fun to touch as well, if you have one. So Moldavite, it was named after the German name of a nearby river from its founding location. And the river is Moldau, okay? Moldau in Czech Republic. So Moldavite basically it, it mainly found in Czech Republic, okay? But it also can be found in Austria and Germany. So why does it have a German name? Because the meteor, the meteor impact was actually occurred in Germany around uh, about 50 million years ago, now known as the Norlinger Rees Crater. Okay, so here is, this picture is, uh, we just showing, I'm just showing the Moldau River that runs across the Bohemia state. Okay, it's actually the longest river in Czech Republic. So just kind of a, a extra knowledge for you guys. Okay, and I have a very interesting map, okay, for, that follows up. So here is the map that I found, okay. And he, it shows the meteor, crater, okay, where the meteor hits in Germany, and where does the debris land in Czech, as you can see, mostly in Czech Republic, okay. So as I mentioned, it, it, it struck the earth almost uh, 50 million years ago, and the crater was 25 kilometers in diameter and 150 meters deep. So it's in the town of Loning, Norlinger, Germany. So you can see how far the debris flew, okay? It actually flew up to 450 kilometers away from the crater right here. So the Stenheim right here on the left side of the Norlinger is, uh, is the smaller meteor that broke up from the, from the main meteor of the Norlinger. Okay, so as you can see the direction of the debris, you can imagine that the meteor actually flew from the left side, okay, flew from the west. And then when it hits, 
it flew all the way to Czech Republic. And right now, Czech Republic is the main producer of Motovite. And you can see some in Austria and on the Northwest, you can see two deposits of the Motovite. So now most, most of the Motovite you see out in the market comes from Czech Republic. And if people stating that it, when it comes from other countries, is most likely uh, not true, okay? Motivite only comes from Czech Republic, okay? And here is Tectite, okay? The, the species of the Motivite, okay? And as you can see in the picture, it's just one big black rock, okay? The, and this is, this picture right here is actually the specimen that can be seen in our museum. And is actually a 15 kilogram tectite from China. Yes, tectite can be found in many countries. Okay. And most of them, they just look black, um, full of holes. And it's not just shaped like a boulder. It could shape like a drumstick, like on the left. So that is in the form of a droplet, okay? When the liquefied sand, when they're still in a molten state, they would drop, they would actually drip like a liquid, but it will not drip as fast. So once, before they even drop, they will solidify and it becomes a drumstick, like the picture on the left. So generally, tectite comes from the word, from the Greek word of tektos, meaning melted. So it makes sense because tectite is um, liquefied sand, melted sand, okay, made by meteorites. So as I mentioned before, Moldovite comes from Czech Republic, but tectite from different countries tends to have different names as well, uh, based on their based on their localities. Okay, for example, Australites. Okay, Australites. Uh, ref is referred to tectites that come from Australia, whereas Philippinites comes from Philippines, but both of them, they are all tectites. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, like a trade name where they want to be exclusive to their own country. You see, oh, this is a, this is a gem coming from my own country. I call it a, a Philippinite or when a meteor lands on Singap lands in Singapore, it will be it will be called a uh, Singaporeanite, right? Singaporeanite. I, I'm not. I don't know. Maybe you can give that opinion, right? So apart from Moldavite, um, the tectites are usually just black or even dark brown and opaque with opaque to seldom trans translucent transparency. Okay. So they are not, they're generally not gem quality, unlike the Moldavite. Even though you cut it, even though you tumble tectite, it will still look black and opaque -ish. So Moldavite is the only gem quality tectite there is. So next would be the Libyan desert glass. This, I find it uh, quite beautiful. Okay, I'm not sure about you guys, but I find it really beautiful because of its color, because of its surface. And um, uh, I would just say, call it LDG, okay? LDG is created by the intensity of either a meteor impact or an atmospheric explosion, okay? Why would I say either a meteor impact or atmospheric explosion? The reason is, for a meteor impact, it had, we must have proof, for example, the crater. The crater is the proof where the meteor hits the earth. As for Libyan desert glass, as the name suggests, it only can be found in Libya, okay? In a, actually in the border of Libya and Egypt is actually a huge desert, okay? So when there's a desert, it's almost impossible to find a crater. So nobody can actually prove that there, that a meteor impact actually occurred in the desert. So some expert would actually believe that an atmospheric explosion occurred um, in, the middle of the, in the middle of the desert, right? So 
although atmospheric explosion doesn't sound as um, doesn't sound as powerful as a meteor impact, it actually can be quite violent. Okay, most one of the most recent um, occurrence happened in Russia in two thousand thirteen. Okay, that is a true story where a meteor flew past our atmosphere. Okay, flew past Russia and it exploded halfway through our surf, our atmosphere, around uh, twenty four kilometers above the Earth's surface. The meteor actually exploded. Okay, exploded. It destroyed. It destroyed buildings. It shattered glass. Um, I mean, it's just it, the meteor only can be seen in the town where in, in, in Russia, okay, a one small town in Russia, but the damage are, are quite significant. Although nobody got injured, it actually damages a lot of buildings. And um, fortunately, the meteor did not hit land. It flew past a lake and most likely most of the, um, the, the debris actually fell into the lake. So that explosion itself, um, what it was measured by scientists, the explosion itself um, was as powerful as, I would say, I think 400 kilotons of TNT. That's almost equivalent to um, around 40 times the, the atomic bomb that landed in Hiroshima. So it, it's just, I mean, it exploded in midair, but the explosion was that huge. So it's almost like, it's almost equivalent to a meteor hitting the earth. So anyways, when I, either way, when either one of them happen in the desert, the same heat from the meteor or the explosion will liquefy the desert sand into fragments of nearly pure silica glass so the Libyan, the LDG was what uh, actually chemically composed of more than 90% silica. So it is um, really pure. And because of the desert, desert color as well, it, it create this stunning golden yellow color. I mean, the top quality of the LD, LDG would be golden color, but it also can be pale yellow or maybe slightly green in color. So we actually have a few examples um, after the slides coming uh, will actually show you. So LDG gained a lot of popularity as a collectible item, okay, despite being a glass. I mean, the color, who doesn't really fall in love with the color? It's golden in color, right? So before that, the pharaohs of Egypt actually the first ones to use the LDG as, um, as an accessory. As you can see in this picture right here, this breastplate belongs to the King Tut, okay? Belongs to the King Tut. And right in the middle of this breastplate, it has a scarab beetle carved out of the LDG. So scarab beetle is um, a symbol of the sun god, but what we can see here is they will actually use a glass as the centerpiece of a very, maybe a very important uh, jewelry or, or an accessory for the king. So um, yeah, the King Tut is actually one of the most studied pharaohs of Egypt because of his well-preserved tomb and um, a lot of um, accessories, heliograph in his tomb as well. But uh, yeah, that's a little bit out of the topic, right? So. Lastly is the fulgurite. Some of you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sh really sure, 100% sure that this can be considered a glass, but it does made up of melted and fused sands, okay? Fused sands that are made when lightning strikes in a sandy area. So everyone knows a lightning is really, really hot, okay? It has tremendous heat, and it goes in a flash, uh, goes in a blink of an eye. So fulgurites happens when the lightning strikes the earth, 
the lightning doesn't really stops on the surface. It will actually go through further down into the sandy, sandy area and it creates this channel, almost like a root, just like the picture on the right. So here, the line right here refers to the surface and the, ground, the lightning bolt would just goes through until it stops somewhere. So it kind of resembles a, a root of a tree, okay? And if it's hot enough, or even the chemicals in the sand is right, it would melt and fuse to create this fulgurite, okay? And some people also call fulgurite as a fossilized lightning, which is really, really cool. I mean, uh, imagine owning a lightning at, at your house. So here are some of the uh, samples uh, that belongs in the museum. So the ones on the one in the left, okay, uh, they, these two actually, there is slightly difference in their chemical properties, okay? Because the one on the left is lighter than the one on the right, because the one on the right is uh, it contains more iron in it. And it's also much heavier compared to the left. So you can see this small picture right here is actually hollow, okay? And when you, and when you hit it slightly against a surface, it actually made this glassy sound, you know, like how you, how you uh, lightly tap on the glass, like ding, 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 ding. Yeah, they actually sounded like that, okay? And fulgurites, they are actually quite uncommon. Okay, despite having lightning strikes the earth a lot, I mean, a lot. I mean, not just one specific location. It, it happens throughout anywhere in the world. Okay, we just don't see, we just don't, didn't notice it. But lightnings do strike the earth a lot. Okay, but it's just full dry. It doesn't happen all the time. Like, Kobin once told me he, he first went to purchase this in the Tucson Fair. And the next year, he doesn't, he didn't really, he didn't see any full dry in the following year, right? So that's, that shows the, how uncommon full dry really are, even though they are like, like a sand, you see? So here's a fun fact, okay? Here's a fun fact. Apart from the previous, uh, I would say four, four different types of natural glass, Trinity, uh, is the code name of the first atomic bomb test in New Mexico desert, okay? Trinity is, uh, okay, the bomb site is called Trinity. And what the byproduct of this bomb test actually gave birth to what we call the Trinitite, okay? It actually is a radioactive glass, okay? And it's green in color. That explains the radioactive substance, okay? Most of the I will not say all green gemstones are radioactive, but some green gems can be caused by radioactive uh, radiation. Uh, for example, green diamonds, they are caused by radiation. Uh, low zircons, they tend to be green and a little bit radioactive. And this is uh, the trinitite also is a radioactive glass, natural glass. So what happens in this trinity, this bomb test? They actually tested this bomb. Um, oh no, this is the first atomic bomb test, okay, that happened in during the World War II. Okay. And it the test was actually uh, well a test for the bomb used in Hiroshima. Okay. And the test eventually created this three meter deep uh, and 335 meter wide crater. And also because of the heat, uh, it, it kind of fused the desert sand into glass as well. This, the picture on the right is not the actual picture of the site. Okay, it's just an illustration of what it looks like after the test. Okay, you can imagine it's full of green glass and um, well, it's not for sale in the market because it's a radioactive. And I would assume the place itself would be prohibited for entry as well. So this is uh, just a little bit out of the topic for your general knowledge, right? So how 
do we test, how do we tell man-made or natural glass? Okay, I remember in class, in gemology class, um, we definitely see a lot of natural gemstones, right? A lot of gemstones um, from anything you can imagine. And once in a while, we would find a glass, a very good glass imitation just to throw the students off. I myself included, I got, I got a little bit cocky. I got a little bit confident. I, I just straight away write the answer as uh, a, a natural mineral by itself. But eventually some of them, some of us got it wrong because we didn't really test the, the, the actual substance um, that is glass eventually. So glass can imitate anything, okay? It can have any colors uh, you like. It can have any tr um, transparency from transparent to opaque. It can be any shape we like or even any patterns. We can add some flakes, some glitter flakes to make it uh, adventurous anything you can imagine, right? So how do we differentiate? Okay, as I, as I mentioned, you can imitate anything. I mean, literally anything. And mammic glass and natural glass tend to have overlapping properties such as the refractive index and specific gravity, also the inclusions. So even for, um, I mean, even for gemologists, you really have to be careful on um, differentiating a mammic glass and a natural glass, right? So the first step is by using your naked eye, by your general observation. And the second, if you have either a loop or even a magnification uh, that would, uh, sorry, a loop or a microscope that would be better, right? Uh, general observation is um, pretty straightforward, uh, not straightforward, is is what we all have, right? Unlike the microscope, um, it can be expensive or sometimes you may not use it, you will not buy it, but your eyes, and the key thing is the, your knowledge about the man-made and natural glass, okay? Your knowledge can distinguish what is real, what is uh, man-made, okay? So for specific patterns, look out for unique patterns such as snowflake, okay? Although uh, snowflakes, the rough shape of the rough or luster, although some might uh, be similar compared to the man-made ones, but snowflakes, um, man-made snowflakes, although I've never seen one before, okay, but I read it, read about it. Man-made snowflakes, they tend to be more individualized, okay? They're more individual patches of whitish, grayish spots. Whereas the natural ones, they can be fused together, right? They can be fused together like this, okay? And sometimes man-made uh, snowflakes, they can be angular as well. You know, the, the patches, they can be angular, um, although they, they will try their best to make it roundish, but the natural ones, they are always round, okay? Or maybe in a shape of a snowflake. So, and here, the surface of a motorbike also can tell whether it's a man-made or, um, or a natural one. So before we started the zoom, zooming into gems, I actually read an article go, um, provided by Kuming himself. It's actually written by Mr. Tay, uh, Kuming's father, uh, regarding that he tested, he received a natural, a, a man-made motorbike, right? A man-made motorbike, and then he compared compare it with a natural motorbike. So the key thing is, although maybe he has used some sophisticated machine, but he also mentioned that the the surface between the natural one and the man-made motorbike are slightly different because the natural ones tend to be more sharp. Okay, it's more rugged. It's more sharp to when you actually feel it, okay? Because they are made through a violent process of the meteor impact, 
okay? Whereas the natural, uh, sorry, whereas the man-made motorbike, they tend to be more smoother to touch. It's almost as if those rugged areas are rounded instead of the sharp, pointy surface of the model, natural motorbike. So why does it happen like that in the man-made motorbike? It's because people would use molds, okay? Um, People use molds, molds created from the natural motorbike. So it will have the, exactly the same shape of the natural motorbike. But once people pour molten glass into the mold, glass tend to be cool and the shape would actually shrink. The glass will actually shrink away from the mold. So that's why um, if you if you know how to differentiate a polished glass, they tend to have this curved facet edges. So it's the same logic, okay? People use mold, but the glass will cool and shrink and ended up being curved a little bit. So that's the difference between the surface of the natural ones and the, um, and the man-made one. So um, another thing is, you can use your common sense. If a thing is too perfect, you always have the right to be suspicious, okay? Um, you can be suspicious, but you cannot just tell the, 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 the retail, the, the salesman saying, oh, yours is fake, you know, or oh, yours is man you can't be, you can't be like that. Just be suspicious. If you still do not have any good feelings about it, just walk away, okay? Nobody is forcing you to buy anything, okay? And next up is the magnification, okay? Oh, I think there's a typo, magnification, okay? I forget about that. So magnification, okay, it involves a loop or a microscope to in inspect anything from a facet stone or uh, a rounded uh, or a tumble stone or the rough stone is a little bit hard to test because of all the rugged surface. A faceted stone, is uh, more suitable because it has windows, it has uh, large facets to look into. And Moldavite especially, because of their transparency, you can see what's going on inside the stone. And they tend to have this odd shaped gas bubble and worm-like swirl marks, okay? Something like this, swirl marks, like worms. And gas bubble, it can be spherical or it can be odd shaped like uh, elongated gas bubble or, or maybe, a, maybe something just squeezing the bubble into a really odd shape. So for those man-made glass, they are, they are made in a controlled environment. So everything, all the inclusions, they are all relaxed, they are all happy, they are all spherical in shape. Okay, not like the model white. They are, as I mentioned, they are created in a violent for uh violent condition. So they would not have. I mean, would not hundred percent would not. But sometimes you can uh observe some weirdly shaped bubble. But the most the key thing is the swirl marks, right? So those are um. It also tells the violent formation of the motorbike, right? So another fun fact, okay? I have a lot of visitors uh, when I talk about glass, they would mention sea glass, okay? Sea glass is something that um, gained publicity in recent years. People find a beach full of sea glass, right? Rounded, tumbled, uh, rough surface, glass, okay? But the fact is sea glass are actually man-made materials that went through natural processes, such as the constant hitting of the current, the waves. It's almost like a tumbling process, okay? So sea glass often originates from glass wastes discarded at sea or shipwrecks of mostly beverage establishments right and quite and it's actually it doesn't take a long time un unlike natural minerals to form it it only take as little as five years 
up to 20 years to, for, for it to get a better shape. And as you can see in this picture, you can see many different colors and people tends to think that it is natural, but yeah, it's man-made. So sorry to burst the bubble, okay? And to end it, we, the summary is man-made glass is inexpensive, they are common, but they are extremely useful. Natural glass can include obsidian, which has the variety of snowflake, rainbow, and sheen. And Moldavite slash Tektite, um, which is Moldavite is the only gem quality, a uh, gemstone quality of Tektite, where, whereas Tektite is a black opaque uh, natural glass. Libin Desert Glass is a golden to pale yellow green glass that only can be found in Libya and between the border of Libya and Egypt and the fulgurite, which is the fossilized lightning, okay? So natural glass can be deferred by their exclusive patterns, formations, and even rarity, okay? Natural glass, such as the Moldavite, um, Moldavite, Libyan desert glass, and fulgurites can be rare, right? And they are definitely getting increasingly collectible for it, right? So. That is all from me. I hope you have fun and I'll pass it back to Kumi to show you some of the real deal, okay? Wow, wow. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for your sharing. And to all our participants, let's check out some uh, real deal. <laughs> uh, let's check out some live demo of some natural glass. Oops. I think I should, see? Can you see that? Can you see this giant piece of rock? Can you, anybody make a guess what is this stone? This stone is, you look at my hand, see? Hi Ida, no problem. You can catch it on YouTube. And uh, this video will still be available on Facebook for the next one week. And after that, we'll remove it. So what do you think this stone is? Can you all let me know in the chat? Uh, just type in, what do you think? What stone is this? Let me carry all this heavy. Wow, look at this. Here has some clues. That's right, Charlene. Wow, obsidian. This is snowflake obsidian. It's as big as my two hands. I think it's about maybe three kilos. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, one of the, it's a rainbow. Let me see. No, I don't think it's not. Mm -hmm. Rainbow, no, I don't, I don't see it. It's mostly uh, the snowflakes. All right, I want to show you. Okay, let's move it up. Oh, this is heavy. Look at this in my hand. It's as big as my face. Yeah, this is one of our uh, samples for the Institute. So if you sign up for the gemstone class, that's, we, do have, uh, we do have classes here. You can sign up for either the Zoom class, then later on you can sign up for the practical class and you can handle gemstones. I want to show you this nice little one. This is a snowflake obsidian cut in the trillion shape. Very beautiful. Let me zoom in. Just look at that. Look at the shape. Looks like <laughs> well, suddenly, I re suddenly I think of COVID. COVID, the virus, the I think it's okay. Never mind. This is not so nice. Huh? Okay, just snowflake. Snowflake sounds better. All right. Okay. Next up, I want to show you this special piece. It is called, let me see if you can guess it. Da, 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 da. Look at that. This is the rainbow obsidian. Let me try and shine some light. Look at the back. Look at that. It's 
really beautiful. Looks like a, uh, you know, uh, what I call it. Uh, suddenly I forgot abalone, abalone shell. Looks like abalone shell. Let me take it. Let me clean it a bit. This one is a giant piece. Looks like it has an eye. Look at that. Very beautiful. And look at that giant one. Giant rainbow obsidian. The actual piece. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at the shin. There's even a cat's eye effect actually. This one that we have. This one we have is about how many carrots is this? This is uh, 17 carrots. Wow, look at that. It's beautiful. So rainbow obsidian. So beautiful. I, I think we need to find a new vocabulary for the word beautiful. <laughs> because every time we say beautiful, Oh, HDR. Oh, sorry. Try this now. Is it better? More clear. Yeah, we need, we need more vocab, you know, Andrew. Beautiful is not enough. Spectacular, spectacular. Let me show you all some tactiles. Oh, after, after Obsidian was tactiles, right? Motorbike. Oh, motorbike. Okay, let me show you some motorbike. So I have uh, this one. This is a 19 gram, 19.5 gram motorbike. It has been tested with FTIR. So you know this is a motorbike. It has the prickly feeling. Very interesting on the shape. Look at the flow marks. The flow marks going like this, you see. It's motorbike. Uh, in Europe, they tend to cut it into gemstones. Oh, look at the holes. Hey, this hole is like all the way in, you know, this little dot there. I zoom in. Look at that. Wow. You can put a wire through that. So cool. This is one of the motorbikes. You can see that. And then let me show you some more motorbikes. We have uh, this motorbike is the uh, sample at the institute. It looks giant. It's like this size. This one is also from Czechoslovakia. Look at that. Can you imagine the the meteor actually hit Germany? <laughs> and it and but then Czechoslovakia has all this Czech Republic uh, and all the motorbikes. Uh, people you also make it into uh, pendants. Let me show you. This one is made in, in a silver pendant. Right? I like the patterns on the on this one. It's like a like a sun like. You know, sun rays going up. Very beautiful. Very unique, uh, very unusual and unique. Motorbike. Yeah, this is 18.94 grams. Okay, I want to show you one more. Okay, maybe two more motorbikes. Are you all enjoying yourself? Yeah, like if you do, you're still enjoying yourself, please. Uh, wow, Noraini said yes. Wow. Thanks for the support. So, so awesome. Okay, this one is really nice. I wanted to show you this. I especially asked my dad to take it out from his collection. Look at this. Okay, let me zoom out a bit. I'll try again. Dun, 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 dun. See, look at the shape. Very unique, right? So awesome. Look at that. Look at the shape. I really like it. Let me zoom in a bit. Look at that prickly appearance. Uh, it reminds me of a dinosaur skin. Although I haven't seen a dinosaur skin 
in real life before, but that's why I, I imagine. I look at that. I like this so much. It is aerodynamic kind of look. Uh, let me see if I have any more interesting pieces. Oh, I have one way upside down like a tooth. Ray, Ray Earn says, I have one piece of uh, tech type that one of my friends gave it to me. He said it's from uh, Indonesia. Look at that. And the best thing, let me try and shine for you. You look at that, it's opaque. I mean, it's not opaque, it's translucent. Oh, yeah, yeah, I haven't shined light like this for you to show you the translucency of the motorbike. So one thing about the Gem Museum is that, uh, is that what happened? Uh? Yeah, you, you, uh, this Charlene say you know, can't tell if it's real. Yeah, you need to run uh, FDIR uh, spectrum on it. I mean, not just using your hands to touch it, but you need to run an FDIR spectrum. Run it through the FDIR. Yeah, it's advanced testing. I think you can send it to my dad to test. I'm not sure about the fees. I think it starts from 150. Yeah. Then you can stop wondering whether it's. Oh, somebody from Facebook, it says, uh, they have a synthetic motor vibe to share. Well, uh, later on, I'm going to share uh, an article from my father. You can download from his website that he, he did a study on uh, motor vibe to see whether the natural motor vibe and then synthetic motor vibe. Not, they're made of Qingdao glass, you know, glass bottles. I want to show you the motor vibe again under the light. Yeah. Yeah, many people they sell. I mean, I mean, not saying they're out to cheat, but you know, sometimes it's really rare. You know, it's really, really rare, and to find it is hard to find. So, people find creative ways to create it. Look at that! Looks so clear. I really like to do this. Yeah. See that? Look at that. I want to show you a cut motor vibe, all right? A cut motor vibe. Hear the sound. Can you hear the sound? Okay, hitting my go ring. Uh, my go ring will become scratch. Yeah. So there are many uh, unusual ways people try to come up with, you know, you like, hear the sound, you know, scratch it or what. But the best is uh, send it to a lab. We do non destructive tests. My dad does non destructive tests. I wanted to show you the cut motor vibe. The, okay, take a look at this 7.11 carat cut motorbike. Look at that. Let me try to focus it a bit. Oops. See the motorbike. And then this light not strong enough. Let me show you doing this. Okay. See that? See the glass? Uh, ah, I see all the bubbles. Yeah. We have to do a magnification to find the swirl marks. And on top of that, do a FTR to find a certain peak that you know that this is natural. If not, from the t looking of this, it looks to me like a uh, fairy dot. Fairy dot. Tweezer. It's a tweezer. Do I have, uh, let me try and get a tweezer here. Okay, to show you the thing again. Okay. Get that better. So much better. Thanks, Wing, for the reminder. Look at that. Really like peridot. Huh? Yeah. So this is uh which has higher value. Which has higher value. I guess a lot of people buy the raw ones. And uh, I think the, there's a bigger market for the raw ones. 
especially those bigger size. I would say, uh, I guess the raw one would be, depends, it really depends. If let's say the cutter who cuts it, it's a very well-skilled one, very famous one, then of course the cutting charges will be much higher. Uh, most cut motorbikes are smaller in size, so you don't see like a giant 20 carat, like, you know, where's that stone? Like this. Like this is so small versus this. All right. Okay, I want to show you some tech types. Tech types. This is from Vietnam. Okay, now we come with all the Philippine Knights and Indonesian Knights, and uh, this is from the Viet Vietnam Knights. The Vietnam Knights are. And look at that. Let's see. This also has an aerodynamic look. Look at that. Looks like a whale to me. Yeah, like a whale. Okay, it also reminds me of Red Pool. But anyway, it's very cute. It's Vietnam. All right. And then I have from Indonesia. This is also a specimen from the Institute. Very cute, you know, this one looks like a human's face. Let me try to look at that. Like I want, like a, there's a few eyes. See, this is like one eye here and then closed eye. And then he's wearing a mask. Yeah, he's wearing a mask because COVID. So one eye and a closed eye. So cute, huh? And here looks like alien three eyes. <laughs> Sometimes you look at stones, you really can really get your imagination go wild. So this is from Indonesia, Indonesian. And I have a Philippine here, Philippines, from Philippines. See, this one looks like, uh, what is it? Uh? It looks like what? Uh? Andrew, what does it look like to you? It's like a walnut. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, walnut. <laughs> That's right. This is a walnut from space. It's really interesting, like things coming from space because of the aerodynamic features. Uh, it looks really unusual and out of this world. Philippite. So, the brothers. And I have, I think this is from China. Looks like a granite stone, uh, those that, uh, <laughs> yeah, the COVID, COVID motorbike. This looks really cute. Looks like Mars. You know, if you zoom in like that. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Zooming in. Can, can make a, a YouTube video like this. Look at that. Yeah, sorry, Thailand. That one was the, just now. This piece is from Thailand. Okay. So awesome. Look at that. Actually, we, you can actually do nice close up photos uh, and make background photos. See, like this for your handphone screen. Look at that. So unique. Okay. What else do I have? Ah, Libyan desert glass. I have a living. Oh, actually, before that, uh, Noraini, I, I just now you said about cut stone for motorbike. I have one here that is on the front is cut, and uh, not cut is raw. Let's zoom in. Look at that, and in the front, it's a star. Yeah. Look at that. So awesome. On the back, on the front. Yeah. Okay, last but not least, I want to show you some Libyan desert glass with my brothers standing behind as support. Brothers of Tech Tax, band of brothers. 
from this from Libyan Desert Glass. This is it looks like a Golden Globe Awards, you know. If you can just put the awards below. Tana. And then I have one more. This is a little bit more green. It, it's red, like a dolphin. Yeah, like, okay. okay maybe not like, like a dolphin looking at you. Shh. Yeah, let's play with some light. It's always good to have light in view. Uh, look at uh, uh, the gas bubbles. Can you see that? Can you see that? The gas bubbles. Oh, I can't really see. Too strong the light. Let me try to. Yeah, see the gas bubbles. Yeah. Take type with transmitted light is now mostly brown. But bright. Okay. Uh, I have to check that. I will check on that. So this Libyan desert glass. Wow. Do you have any questions? I think that brings me to the almost the end of. Unless you want to see, do you all want to see one more, uh, motorbike? show you one more motorbike one more motorbike really cute one okay really really cute i've been showing you a lot of giant size ones i better use my tweezer a little i show you my sweaty pumps Ta -da -da. okay here yeah, i cannot this these brothers are behind are very distracting better remove them okay brothers thanks for showing off how black is black you know, if you are interested to get a black stone, uh, Tecta is, a, is something interesting that you can get. Okay, before, oh yeah, I want to show, let's show you this before I just go on to the events. Look at this, it's really small, it's not, look at that. You can make this, this is motorbike. Yeah, motorbike. So cute. Okay, so uh, Hui now is sharing about our upcoming topics, which is the, which is on tomlins, uh, and uh, just want to show the end of this. With, yeah, go to my slide which is here, you can take a look, gemlab.com. You just go there and search for Motivite under articles. You can find uh, this uh, research paper that was published in the Austrian, Australian Gemologist, Volume 23, 2 in 2007. Uh, my father wrote this uh, article on Motivite, natural or imitation for uh, Cathy. You asked a question whether how to, how to tell. Uh, at the end of it, I mean, you can look for sewer marks, you can look for the prickly feeling, but the conclusive one would be actually doing an FTIR. Uh, in the, inside the article, you can see the FTIR readings. That will help you very much. Uh, yes, so by the way, you know, it's children's season now until 3rd of January. Uh, those of you who love to visit museums, there are 21 museums that took part in our children's season. So there's many events I think there are 60 over workshops for you and your child to enjoy all over Singapore. So don't have to go overseas. You can go museum hopping. And in our museum, we do have some star gem adventure. Uh, to, so far, we're almost fully booked yet. Uh, we do have some slots left. Uh, please go to thegemmuseum.eventbrite.com to have a look and reserve your slots ASAP. We also have a uh, pet rocks where you can do really cute uh, gemstone rocks with your children. Uh, and last but not least, gem art. Uh, so far, 
yeah, we, we come and invite you to our museum to enjoy these activities. And those of you who would like to visit our, our museum, due to COVID, we are having this uh, booking system here. You just book a time slot so that we know that you're coming so that we will not, uh, we will prevent overcrowding. Yes. And uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. We just go down to YouTube and uh, find us at the Gem Museum. Uh, we're going to put this webinar up uh, shortly. And uh, yeah, there are many, many other videos for you to explore the world of gemstones. And uh, it's going to be exciting. So do join us on our YouTube and hit that notification button. Uh, last but not least, we do have uh, the Gem Museum shop if you want to collect for, uh, for yourself some some motorbikes or some, some stones, uh, you just go to Lazada. I'm not sure if we have motorbikes there, but uh, in our actual shop inside the museum at 26 Kandahar Street, you will be able to find some beautiful collectibles. Um, yeah, even for children, we have stones from, I don't know, $5 onwards. So yeah, do come down and uh, have a look. So that's the end of my presentation. And uh, thank you very much all for joining us. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And see you in the next time. Oh, the next one will be in January, Paribas and Co. about tourmalines. Yeah. Andrew, do you have anything to say about the upcoming one? It's going to be complicated. <laughs> complicated. Yeah, because tourmaline is a really complicated yes. uh, gemstones, but super beautiful. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, any last words, Andrew or Huying? Thank you for joining. I'll see you in the next webinar. Sneak peek. No, la, no sneak peek. Next time, right? <laughs> okay, bye everyone. Thank you bye. for thank you for joining us for webinar. Yeah, do if you like, uh, come visit us. Come and visit us. We'd like to see, say hi to all of you, especially in the museum. Plus, um, by the way, the Malay Heritage Center is also having some uh, activities. Uh, do do join them. It's actually they're having a exhibition on the Banjaris from South Kalimantan, and uh, we do we have a collaboration with the Malay Heritage Center. We, do, we are doing gem mining and gem collecting workshops there. Uh, feel free to just search on uh, on their website, Malay Heritage Center, and uh, join. And we have an upcoming, and there's an exhibition there right now showcasing some of our diamonds, our rough diamonds. If you want to see some rough diamonds from Kalimantan, just head over to Malay Heritage Center. For Singaporeans and PR, it's free. For foreigners, it's $8 per entry. And uh, yeah, the exhibition will be ongoing for the next eight months. Uh, but And one thing very special, we, uh, we did a collaboration with Malay Heritage Center and the Riggs Museum in Holland to create a replica of the Banja diamond, which is a 33 karat diamond. Wow. Okay, and we, we, we helped them to, to create it. We cut it, uh, we, yeah, we cut it and it's beautiful. Just, you have to go and take a look, have to go and take a look and it's free. Yeah, it's free, so just go. <laughs> and uh, don't stay at home. So, I mean, do stay at home, stay safe. But uh, if you need to have some relaxation, please go to the, the Malay Heritage Centre and to all other children's museums. There are 21 museums out there. Go and explore, go and enjoy. There, there are so many fun things to do these holidays and have great bonding time with your children. Yeah, and also come down to our museum. Yeah, we love to meet you. So uh, why I talk about the Malay Heritage Centre is because one of our webinar participants actually heard about it and brought her children there. And uh, Andrew met you, right? Yes, she she mentioned about the webinar and was I don't even know who she was. And then until she met, she she mentioned about the webinars. Yeah, so amazing. Yeah, so okay. Thank you very much for the wonderful evening. I hope you enjoy yourself. We really enjoyed bringing out the gemstones, the beauty of gemstones, the history, the stories. You know, the whole mine to market process of gemstones is totally amazing. There are many gems we cover. Next week, we are covering a gem called tourmaline. It's more common, but this week, we're doing something uncommon, which is natural glass. And uh, yeah, although it's not as rare, it's also rare. It's uncommon. 
yeah so thank you very much and see you really soon bye bye, bye.